All righty, we're going to go ahead and begin. Um, we have some who are watching at home. You may need to refresh this page to get the current copy of today's lesson. Um, if you've been on this page for about 10 minutes um, under the link, you would have had last week's lesson. But if you'll refresh the page, you'll be able to download today's lesson. And that's one that we passed out here. Hey there, Dale. Hello, Joe. Everything okay? Yep, I finally found the source. All right. They said they put the order in. Me. Me. Sounds good. All right, before we begin with our study, let's go to our Heavenly Father in the word of prayer. I ask Dan if you would to direct our minds in that prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come for thee in the most thankful manner that we know how. Thank you indeed for all you do for us and all that you have done in the past. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll uh, look down upon us in tender mercy and as we repent of our sins and ask for thy forgiveness that you will extend that forgiveness towards us. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for the church and we thank thee for thy word that makes us profitable servants of thine and we pray that you'll be with us as we study so that we can improve our service to thee. We ask thee, Heavenly Father, to, uh, to extend your healing hand on the members of this local congregation who are undergoing maladies of uh, physical nature and we pray that you'll be with them and strengthen them and use us in thy service to uh, help them any way we can. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for those of our number who may be uh, weaker spiritually and help us to encourage them and to strengthen them in their service unto thee. Uh, all these things we bring before thee through our your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> when we had sketched out this particular study, let me bring the chart up real quick. I'll show you everything that we have talked about so far in this particular study. Um, was it? Won't look very long for it, though. Well, I don't have it on my desktop. I thought I did here. Anyway, some of the things that we've talked about in the course of the study are the various aspects. Um, when studying through the scriptures, we would find the various blessed are statements. Um, and we've looked at a number of blessed are statements. A lot of them, of course, were found in the Sermon on the Mount, but we only spent two lessons looking at those blessed are statements. And what we're doing with this was this, as far as the lesson plan I had sketched out, was intended to be the last lesson for this particular study. And we were supposed to have had this lesson before the Christmas break. But due to uh, me being gone out of town unexpectedly and a couple weeks of illness there, it threw us behind a little bit. So I'm not certain as of yet where we will go to next Tuesday. Um, I may look through some of the other blessed are statements that uh, are found in the scriptures and see if we might be able to extend the study for a couple more weeks. There may be another different, another direction that we can take in this study. Um, if not, I'll see if I can come up with a real simple set of studies that we can do until we run through April and bring this particular uh, time period of study there to an end. Um, but last week, if you'll notice, and they're noticed in our last lesson, we talked about blessed are those who are watchful, if I remember correctly. And blessed are those who are watchful. And, and what we're talking about in today's lesson is blessed are those who are faithful until the end. Now, with some of these lessons, we've isolated the statements or the verses that contain the blessed are statements and show that they're the foundation for the lesson. What we did with this one is we have incorporated them within the overall concept here in the lesson of uh, blessed are those who are faithful to the end and you'll recognize these as we go of course through our study the passages that are pulled for this so let's go ahead and begin notice the very first point there's a statement that is made in Revelation made two or three different times but let's focus first off in Revelation chapter 1 and let's read there verses 1 through 3 for just a moment and Dell, if you would take a moment and read that 
for us. Revelation 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. All right, thank you. Now, you'll notice here for just a moment the statement, initially in this verse, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy would look like this would kind of belong in one of our earlier lessons and talking about Bible study. And, and it, rightfully it, we, it would, we may have actually used that verse in that passage uh, or in that particular lesson. But the reason why I brought it into this lesson though is because what we are preparing ourselves for, he says, for the time is near. Okay. Um, so we'll say, what's the point of Bible study? Well, so we can obey God. But really, what's the point of Bible study? So we can be prepared. Because the time is near. Uh, turn over to James chapter 5. We'll step out of Revelation for just a moment. And James makes a very similar statement to this. Um, in James chapter 5, verse 8. But instead of telling us to study and so forth, you'll notice here he says something a little bit different. And let's see, Miss Mary, would you mind reading for us James 5, verse 8? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. All right, here in this particular verse, he tells us to be what? Patient. To be patient, okay? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, we have to keep in mind that when anytime we see passages that talk about is at hand, you've got to think about at hand in relation to the whole of creation and the whole of time. Um, and when you stop and think about the dispensation scenes within the, the, uh, the teaching of the scriptures, the patriarchal and then of course the mosaical, and then the new covenant established by Christ, at hand is relative to what Jesus was promising that would come. And it's, there's not going to be another dispensation that will come. There's not going to be one more covenant that will have to be established. The next thing after Jesus' death upon the cross of Calvary, the next major event after that covenant is going to be his return, coming of the Lord. Any thoughts or comments about that? Dan? I think uh, the coming of the Lord is at hand would, would kind of be... Uh, mean different things to different people. In other words, uh, if, I, if I live to be 80, then it's at hand for me. The coming of the Lord is at hand for me. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So in, instead of you talking, instead of you looking at a hand... I don't know uh, if we'll experience a passing of time uh, mm -hmm. after the spirit leaves the body I don't know how much how much time we will experience at that point so uh, all I can uh, go is <coughs> my coming of the Lord is uh, closer than it was uh, 69 years ago well and I think Paul makes that state a similar point that the um, the day of salvation <clears throat> the point is, we're closer now to it than we were at the beginning. And the kind of the, the, the thought there that Nance pointed out is we would think, you know, here's the cross, and we've gone 2,000 years, very roughly, and it may be another 2,000 years, and then finally you've got the return of the Lord. But if we look at it from our individual lives, then it is start with our birth as a Christian, or start with the physical birth, then you become a Christian, and then the day of the Lord is, for all its purposes, because we come face death. After death, we know that there's the judgment. Um, whether You're right. Whether there's the experiencing of the passing of time or not is irrelevant. The next thing that's most important to us after our death is the judgment of God. Yeah. That's a good way of looking at that, too, being at hand. Yeah. Any other thoughts? <coughs> all right. The word time mm -hmm. is near here. Mm-hmm. chapter 1 verse 1, the word shortly is used there, which mm -hmm. is a Greek word. 
we don't know when time is going to end for us. Right. And so the idea is, and you know, this is a, a good blessing here. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words. The word hear obviously means not only read, but comprehend mm -hmm. and retain it. Right. Uh, for the time is near. That's a good point. And, and another point mm -hmm. that uh, goes along with that, that strengthens that uh, line of thinking, is establish your heart. Okay. Because there's going to be a point, <laughs> the time is at hand, when you will no longer be able to establish your heart. Okay. Because you you no longer uh, be uh, living in this body, and no, you can't do anything after that to change what has been done. We're going to receive uh, rewards or punishment for what we've done in the flesh. So uh, the time is at hand. Okay. It would be the the physical life that you spend as far as establishing your heart. Okay. So, so. All right. And for the recipients of the of um, Revelation, the letters, and then the prophecy. What what was the point for telling them the time is at hand? Remember what they were about to go through, and we're going through. Yeah. Persecution, persecution. Exactly. You know. Rome being persecuting them to death. Yeah. So I mean, this you know, for us, we have comfort in knowing that the day of the Lord is going to come. But imagine someone undergoing extreme persecution and thinking, is it worth it? And he said, yes, because of the day of the Lord is at hand. I mean, as he says there, the uh, things that are soon to take place, and turn with me over to the next uh, passage in the lesson, Revelation 22, and notice with me there in verse 7. Notice the first three words there. Let's go ahead and look at that. Uh, Miss Florence, would you read verse 7 for us? Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. All right, notice the phrase, the, the beginning of this. Behold, I am coming quickly. All right, these are things, as Dale pointed out, we'll go in verse 1, but shortly come to pass. Um, and then let's go down in the same uh, text there, down to verse 10. And let's see, Miss Pat, would you mind, uh, Pat Cunningham, would you read that for us, please? And he said to me, do not the words of the prophecy of this book for the time of the hand. Okay. It's not Cunningham. No, but it's oh. close enough. Oh. <laughs> it used to be. It used to be. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Since I said that, no, 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 no. Um, now notice here, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. Okay. The time when these things were about to take place, about to come to pass. And then the last one, is verse 12. Jump down a couple of verses there to that, and Hannah, if you would read that, please. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Okay, again, the phrase, he says, behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. All right, so any thoughts or comments about the time being near? One more, and then I'll be quiet. I'll try to. Uh, we were in Second uh, Peter chapter three, while ago, mm -hmm. and in Second uh, Peter chapter three, verse nine, it says, "The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but is long suffering." That's they right. were they were questioning, you know, "Where is this coming? Why, why is it taking place? Where is it?" You know, they were getting impatient for the coming of Christ, mm -hmm. and He told them, uh, "The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but He's being long suffering to us, not wishing that any should perish." So, uh, He's it's going to happen, and it's coming. And then we find here that it, it is at hand. So. Okay. All right. That's a good point. Miss Mary? <clears throat> you know, uh, it says that if we live to be 100 years, your life is still a vapor. Yeah. And one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day to God. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't count time to us. 100 years is a long time. But it's still just a vapor in the overall picture. Okay. Comes and it's gone. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? All right. So, in following along there with the lesson, the thought here, we know the time is near and we're talking about being prepared. So, we ask the question, how are we to prepare? Now, there are a lot of things that we could talk about. Okay. But we're going to pull four very specific things 
that may be seen as, as a generalized statement, but yet demands a lot of specificness, if you would, uh, if that's the word specificness, I guess, um, within our lives as Christians as we strive to live faithfully. So, let's look first off at Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to read the first six verses there. We've got to hold fast until the end. Um, and I, I have the question here, how are we to prepare? Maybe that's really not the right question. How are, to we, how are we to remain prepared? That might be a, a better way of asking the question. Um, but let's go ahead and take a minute and read that. And Rod, if you would, we'll break this up a little bit. Read for us the first three verses, please. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus who is faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house was more honor, has more honor than the house. All right, and then, John, would you mind taking us four to six? For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. All right, thank you. Now, let's back up there for just a moment. As you can tell, obviously, that the key verse is going to be verse 6 there. But there is some background to this in this context. I think it's very important to the understanding of that. All right, notice there he calls us holy brethren, partakers of this heavenly calling. And he tells us to consider the apostle high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. His faithfulness to God. Okay who was faithful to him who appointed him. He uses Moses as an example of one who is faithful in all his house. Then he says, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory, that is Jesus, counted more worthy than Moses. All right, he who built the house has more honor than the house. Every house is built by someone. He who built all things is, of course, God. Again, Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, but Christ as a son over his own house. Now here's the point. Look at verse 6 there. He says there quite clearly whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm to the end. This is the point. Whose house we are. Okay. When we, talk, when we stop and we think about this for just a moment, we recognize that we are looking ahead and being prepared for the end. But in, but in order to be prepared for the end, we have to be a part of his house. And we can only remain a part of the house if we hold fast to confidence. Um, it's interesting, he makes a comparison between Jesus and Moses. Uh, he refers to Moses as being a, 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 a what of the house? Servant. Yeah, servant of the house. But he refers to Jesus as the son of the house whose house we are if we hold fast to confidence. How, how would we view ourselves in this comparison? You know, Moses was over the house there, and that's kind of a, an allusion, if you would, to the Mosaical Covenant, the, the leader of God's people and everything. But Moses was still serving God as a servant. Jesus, on the other hand, is the son of the house. But yet, could we also say and this, I may be stretching it more than what, what we are allowed to stretch it here. We know that we are of the house. Here's the question. How are we of this house? We are joint heirs with Christ, so we can also be considered sons. Mm -hmm. All right. The house. And as a son works for his father, we are also servants. Okay. So you can, you can take that to fruition on both sides and apply that to son and servants. But, okay. Uh, I think since we are joint heirs with Christ, we could be considered sons of the house. Okay. But what aspect of that would give Jesus more authority than us? He was over the house. Why was he over the house? Firstborn. He owns it. Okay. He's firstborn. Okay. Firstborn of all creation, in effect. Okay. 
Um, and you're right, that was the easy answer. God appointed it. That's what <laughs> the Hebrew writer tells us. That's exactly right. But from the standpoint, since we are the children of God and we are joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8 talks about that, then how would we come into play? Well, Christ is the firstborn. He's over the house. We are his fellow brethren only by the spirit of adoption. You know, only, only by that spirit of adoption, the grace and mercy of God. And so it's kind of a dual role we play. Our attitude, according to what Jesus said, are to be kind of, is to be the attitude of servants. After we've done all that we've been commanded to do, we still declare ourselves unprofitable servants, servants of God. But yet we're also children of God, Romans chapter 8. And so it's kind of a dual, dual role there. But, but what, what brought this to mind was the phrase that Jesus was a son, Moses was a servant, and if we are the children of God, where would we fit? Well, we're of the house. But we're not the firstborn. Jesus is. And we are brought in by the adoption. And we have the attitude of thankful servants, but yet faithful children. And what's interesting is, you know, since when you adopt a child, I remember that being one of the points that the judge brought out um, when we adopted Micah. He has this same rights, privileges, access to everything that the ones that we gave birth to do. And we had to agree to that in yeah. order for the adoption to be finalized. Um, which, to me, that's the same way. We're adopted, but we have access to heaven just like the firstborn did. We, we have access to, to God as our Father just like the firstborn does. You know, and so we need to be thankful for that and, and, and see it as a blessing and not take it for granted. That's right. Of course, if you were to ask Hannah, Rebecca, and Sarah, they probably would view Micah as having more privileges than them when we first got them. Yeah, he got his own room. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I couldn't remember an example. That was it right there. All, of her, all three girls were together, and Micah yeah. had his own. <laughs> um, <laughs> any other thoughts or comments on that? All right, let's look at the next thing. So we know that we're to hold fast our confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. But let's also consider the fact that we are to be faithful until death. Now, oftentimes we think of Revelation 2, verse 10. We'll look at that in a moment. But go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and look at the Apostle Paul's statement here. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll read verses 6 through 8. And Sister Sheridan, you have to forgive me. Your first name has just left my brain. Uh -huh. Is it Sheridan? Vincent. Where is that? Are you sure your last name's not? You're not looking at me. I am. Marsha. John, I apologize. I've, I've had your last name as Sheridan, but I know it. you're right. It's Vincent. <laughs> you're right. Y'all know last name. Can you go ahead and leave that on your Marsha. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Okay. An old one, isn't that? Yes. Not you, but the... the, the You're just doing yourself a hole. Well, let's read that if you would, please, and get me out of trouble. Um, if you would, read verses 6 through 8 for us, Miss Marsha. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Okay, thank you. Now, just real quick here, notice this. Paul talks about he's, you know, he's giving his life effectively in service to God, and he talks about he has fought the fight, he's finished the race, he's kept the faith. Now, he's reached the end of his life for all intents and purposes. All right? He's not yet dead, but he knows that he's reaching the end of his life. And so he observes, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. So we see here a faithfulness until death. And Paul recognizes that on the other side, there is this crown of righteousness that will be given to him by the righteous judge the Lord. But he says, not to me only, but also to all who what? Yeah, all who have loved his appearing. Now with that in mind, turn back to Revelation 2 verse 10. And notice here in Revelation 2 verse 10, in talking to the church there in Smyrna, 
And let's see. Miss Karen, would you read that for us, please? Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. All right, thank you. This verse is a lot like Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Because the key point of that verse we always remember is that as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. But there's so much preceding that. Same with Revelation 2, verse 10. Oftentimes we'll quote the last statement, be faithful until death, and I'll give you a crown of life. But here within this, we see the promise to the, to the saints there in Smyrna. He's telling them, don't fear the things that you're about to suffer. Don't fear. Don't give in to the fear. Don't allow it to, to, to influence you away from serving God. Some of you are going to be thrown into prison. Some of you are going to be tested. And you'll have tribulation 10 days. Not 10 literal days, okay? But the idea as we've talked about, it's going to be a, a full span of tribulation that they're going to have to face because of their service unto God. So... Be faithful until what point? Death. I heard someone suggest one time that we might look at this phrase as be faithful even until death. Okay. Um, until death means you're faithful for the rest of your life. But it doesn't necessarily factor in the non-natural event that terminates your life because of your faith in Christ. You know, it's one thing to understand, yeah, we all must die at some point. That's the natural course of life. But to face the time when there's a sword against your throat, like these Christians very well may have faced and would have faced, <clears throat> it's at that point that this statement becomes even more true. Be faithful until death or even until death. And I'll give you a crown of life. Yes, John? Be faithful even if it kills you. I like that. Yeah. That's the point. Be faithful even if it kills you. And yeah. Either one of them, one doesn't disqualify the other. No, that's right. But, but both ways of looking at it ends up with the same result. But, uh, but if you say be faithful uh, even if you're going to get killed for being faithful, yeah. uh, you know, it gives it a little bit more meaning to these people. Mm -hmm. uh, but either way, you're going to be faithful unto death, whether it's at the yeah. sword of your uh, of God's enemy or uh, falling in a crevasse or something. That has nothing to do with you. Falling into a what? Crevasse. I just had to come up with something real quick. Okay. He just, he just learned that word yesterday. No. <laughs> but... But I, but I think that's the way of looking at it. I mean, we, we, we may face death for a, a hundred different causes. I mean, it could be accidental, it could be willful, it could be natural. But to stand in front of, not stand in front, but to be killed because of our faith. That's, that's what they're facing here. You know, and that's as, I like the way John put it there, even if it kills you. That's a good, good way of looking at that. Whatever it's for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, of, of the apostles, and this I say by tradition, uh, meaning um, by non-inspired text, how many of the apostles is supposed to have died a natural death? One. Just one. Yeah, John the Baptist. Uh, John, not <laughs> John the Baptist. He was <laughs> lost his head. Um, but the apostle John. And somewhere, and I don't remember um, when the, when we were studying through First and Second and Third John, and looking at some of the commentaries and, and how late John wrote those books, and there's some extra writings that 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 have some interesting possible information about John, because John John lived to be an old age, uh, very very old age by comparison to everyone else, and there are some early second century writers that is said to have been taught by John, you know maybe students of John. And in their writings, supposedly, John was poisoned, but yet lived. And I have to go back and find, and I'm not saying it's gospel, but supposedly in those records, it, the story is told of someone trying to poison him, but yet, yet not working, you know. Um, but 
Peter is said to have hung upside down. And uh, there is thought that Jesus alluded to that um, in the Gospel of John towards the end. Uh, which one for certain do we know was killed by Herod? James. James. Yeah, James was. Clearly, clearly lost his life in the, the text of the scriptures. And there's, there's um, Fox's Books of Martyr, I think, kind of talks about this, uh, the rest, the death of the other apostles, if I remember correctly. Um, but the apostles get the highlight, but this is going to go on for another roughly 200 years after this point, the persecution of the saints. So, um, any, other, any other thoughts or comments? It's something we need to take to heart with the way the world is going. You know, our, our, I remember my mom saying it would be her great, great grandchildren who would feel that verse again, you know, at some point, which is kind of odd the way the world is turning. You know, more and more persecution against those who claim to believe in Jesus yeah. as the Lord. Thirty years ago, we, we would not have fully understood the potential shift that's, that's taken in the world view right now. Um, because, you know, it's, and I, I understand her saying that, but to try to see the world changing in such a way to where here in America, if you profess a belief in Christ, you're going to die, seems just impossible. But... You know, there, I mean, and, and I still believe that our governmental system is established as such that would keep that from ever happening. It would be a complete overthrow, doing away with the democratic system and the elections and so forth. Uh, but there is a, a lingering threat that's kind of like this big that if, if not kept in check and grows, who knows? It might be two or three more generations later. Um, but... Um, but th this was something different, though. I, I, I don't believe the church will ever face this level of persecution. I think this was Satan's, and, and the way Revelation's kind of pictures painted, I think this was Satan's attempt to stop what the Lord had started. And this was an intense persecution. Some, uh, it was off and on. There were some leaders who didn't persecute Christians as harshly, but for almost 300 years until Constantine came into play, it was not an uncommon thing for Christians to die as a cause of their belief in Christ. So for it to get that way again would be pretty intense. But it wasn't worldwide either. You know, it was only within the scope of the Roman Empire and where the, the cities and the rulers wanted to apply their laws to that extent. Uh, anyway, that takes us back to our study of the Revelation. We'll notice here in Revelation chapter 14, let's read real quick uh, 12 and 13. Uh, Miss Phyllis, if you would. Here's the patience of the saints. There are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. All right, notice the phrase there in verse 13. Here's one of the other blessed are statements. Um, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And I see a connection here between the thought of being faithful unto death, or even if it kills you, um, the patience of the saints, what those have. And, and there are two levels of persecutions, if you remember from our Revelation study. There was the one level of those that had already been persecuted, and the Lord had heard, the, heard their prayers and were waiting for the, the judgment, waiting for God's wrath. But then you had those who were going to be persecuted, but ultimately the victory would come about. And it was the Lord hearing their prayers and the patience of the saints, knowing that even if they die, that they die in the Lord from now on and will rest from their labors and their works will follow them. All right, any other thoughts? All right, so we've talked about how are we to prepare ourselves or remain prepared. We hold fast to the confidence to the end. We are to be faithful unto death. But we're also to endure the temptations that we face. This, face. this one's very simple. Turn with me over to James chapter 1, verse 12. James 1, verse 12. I believe, I believe the first part of James is more talking about the trials that one would face, maybe because of, of Christ, maybe just general trials in li or of life in general. But notice here in verse 12 for just a moment, Kelvin, if you would read that for us. Blessed is the man who endured temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. 
All right, here we're talking about enduring the temptations that we face. If we wanted to expand this particular part of the study, we could think about 1 Corinthians 10, 13, how that with every temptation there is a way of escape. And we do know from John chapter 2 that if we sin, if we give in, that we have an advocate with our Father, Jesus Christ, propitiation for our sins, we can ask God to forgive us. But the overall aspect of the man who endures is the man who does not give up. He might stumble and fall, but he gets himself back up. And he does not allow the temptations to thwart his efforts to serve God. So he endures until the end. And as a result, he'll receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised. Okay. Um, we can kind of connect that with 1 John chapter 3. Uh, reading it Sunday morning from the English Standard Version, the thought is that we are not to go on sinning. We're not to continue sinning. If we sin, we repent. But if an individual continues in sin, then the Word of God is not in that individual. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, I believe that was. All right, so we need to endure temptations. Any thoughts or comments? And he doesn't let up. The temptations will not let up until the day we die. They may change forms. They, in other words, we may have different weaknesses through the years, different strengths that are developed within our lives, but there will always be those efforts to cause us to stop the race. And that's the fourth point there. We need to run the race that is set before us. The Apostle Paul, in writing there to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, looking just at this particular verse here, Let's go ahead and read that, if you would, please, Miss Brenda. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Then they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but not be an imperishable. All right, thank you. That was, um, what translation was that? New American Standard. New American Standard, okay. I don't have that one on here. The English Standard is very similar to that. Um, the idea of the wreath there is, is the concept of the crown that is translated in the New King James translation. Um, and here it says every athlete exercises self-control in all things. The point is that everyone who competes, think about to the games, um, that they, the, the, the Olympic Games is another example of looking at. And this might be of sorts what Paul was alluding to. But think about the games of competition. And the reason why everyone would compete even on the bachelor program that we have. There's a level of competition, I guess. Um, I only say that because I took flipped the TV last night. It was like the last five minutes, and I got to see the last girl get a rose. <laughs> and the others walked away brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there was a competition there of sorts, going for a prize. Now here in this case, in the races, the games, he says now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. You know, the, the wreath, the crown would perish. You know, and, and you, you're not going to wear it the rest of your life because people look at you funny if you do. Um, but we are striving for an imperishable crown. And an imperishable crown. You might make the connection with lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Uh, Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. But this is, the point here is though, is we have to complete the race. We can't allow ourselves to give up. He continues in the text there, and he makes the statement there. He says, I run thus, not with uncertainty. He says, I fight, not as one who beats the air. But instead, he disciplines his body, Paul does, lest when he preached to others, he would become disqualified or a castaway. And so that's why we don't give up in the race as well. All right, any thoughts or comments? He said, I was going to finish. I have, I, have, I have finished the course. That's right. So didn't give up. I finished it. And, he, and, and that's a good point. He was only talking about his impending death. He wasn't saying, I don't have to do anything else now, you know. But as far as he was concerned, he had lived his life the way the Lord had told him to. <coughs> You go back to verse 25 that you were looking at there. Yes. Uh, there's a lot more in that verse than what we sometimes think about when he says everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Mm -hmm. Think about uh, whether you're talking about uh, football, uh, basketball, 
which we saw last night, and we know that Kevin Durant couldn't play last night because of a, a sprained toe. That was a better example than the Bachelor show, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the the point is that these athletes go through a lot of pain, okay. a lot of uh, workouts and everything to condition themselves for something that is very temporary. Okay. Uh, these athletes are only going to be able to compete for anywhere from five to maybe 15 years if they're lucky. Uh, and what he's talking about here is that we go through this same kind of pain and everything, facing the tribulations that we face and everything, okay. but our purpose is for a crown that is imperishable. That's a good point. It's not, not, there's no guarantee that it's an easy race, because it's not, and it's not a short race because it's long, but we put forth the same, it, it, more effort than what you were talking about as far as what the athletes would put forth, think, think about what we would put forth. It's a good illustration, that's a good point, Dale. Very good point. Um, any other thoughts or comments? <clears throat> Ms. Pat? The word beating the air, that would be a, a good example of it being futile. Right. The, you don't um, get anything for that. You're just hitting it something that's not worth what you really think it is. Yeah. But with God, you're not beating the air. You are working toward the goal. Well, that's right. The English Standard Version renders it, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. In other words, you know, when a boxer is practicing, he may be beating certain things, but he's not fighting a what? An opponent, unless he's sparring, okay? <coughs> and so, Paul's saying, you know, it's not like what you were saying. It's not a wasted effort. It's not an empty effort. He's not fighting as if there's no enemy there. He's putting forth the full effort. His run is not an aimless run. It is a determined run. And his fighting, his boxing, is with an actual an opponent, and which brings danger and, and, and things like that. But that's, that's a good point. Good point. Any other thoughts or comments? <clears throat> but we do fight the devil. We do? Constantly. And that's right. We fight against, fight against those temptations, and we fight against... Everything that is presented, that's ungodly. Exactly. Well, you think about James' statement, James 4, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Yeah. Um, but the contrast, or what goes with that, is draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. But it is a fight. That's right. Um, any other thoughts? Well, yeah, Paul also mm -hmm. said he, he finished, of course, he said, I have kept the faith. That's right. So it's not just a certain uh, resistance. <laughs> But there's something that you can do. He said, I've kept the faith. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay, any other thoughts? All right, let's go ahead and take a minute and look at the third point. And the question is, why should we be prepared? There's two passages that I want to use to kind of answer that question. The first one is found over in the book of Romans. Let's turn to Romans chapter 2. And we're going to start there with verse 5. <coughs> And let's see, Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Let's kind of break this up as well. And Miss Pat, if you would read for us beginning in verse 5, and let's read down through verse uh, 8, please. But in, but in accordance with your hardness and your incentive heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance and continuance in doing in doing good seek the glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self seeking and do not obey but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Alright, and kind of breaking in mid thought there, but Miss Judy, if you would finish us up nine to eleven. <clears throat> tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. All right, thank you. Sorry about that. I gave you a bad break point uh, with that. <laughs> uh, very bad break point. Um, now, the point that we're making isn't so much verses 5, 6, and 7. Notice here specific, well, it is in verse 7 there. 
But notice in verse 6, the fact that God will render to each one according to his deeds. This is why we want to be prepared. This is why we need to be ready for that day. Eternal life is going to be given to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. All right, so we stop there. All right, at this particular point. Because in rendering to each one his deeds, who will, to whom will he give eternal life? Well, to those who patiently continue in doing good. And in so doing, they seek glory, honor, and immortality. They seek that which God has promised them. And then if you'll jump down to verse 10, he then says, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Kind of a restatement of what is said there in verse 7. But here we have glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good. The flip side of the coin, though, is found in verse 8. To those who are self-seeking and do not obey the, the truth, they instead obey unrighteousness, they are going to receive indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish. Those four things on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. And so what's interesting, oftentimes when we look at passages such as this, um, we, we always look at the positive side. Everybody can be saved. Jew or Greek, it doesn't matter. But also everybody can be lost. Jew or Greek, it doesn't matter. God's going to treat all or judge all by the same judgment by his word. And so if we strive to be faithful, then we will, as he, or more, if we strive to do good, and then he will give us that glory, honor, and immortality. Any thoughts or any comments? Well, that's, that's keeping the faith. It is, yeah. It <laughs> is keeping the faith. That's exactly right. It is walking by faith, as Paul says that we do. That's right. The most important part of that is immortality. That's right. That spiritual immortality. That's right. All right. And now let's turn over to 1 Corinthians. Let's talk about the reasons for our faithfulness. And let's see. Let's check the time. I'm going to reverse these verses uh, from what I have them in the outline. Go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 22. I want to look at that one first. We're going to be reading verses 12 through 15. Then we'll go back and read Paul's um, description of what happens um, at or when the Lord comes again. Let's go ahead and read the Revelation chapter 22. Let's begin reading in verse 12. And Dan, if you would just read verses 12 through 15, please. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. I give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. The outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. All right, thank you, Dan. Now, notice there in verse 14, you'll see another blessed R statement. And all the ones for the lesson came from the revel various revelation texts we've looked at. But notice the beginning of it. Blessed are those who do what? Okay. Now, again, the context of this, we might look at it real quickly and say, well, this is more blessed are those who obey God, you know, who do his will. But we look at the, again, like we did um, with Revelation 1, verse 3, it is the end result that we are focusing on for this study. If we do his commandments, then we have the right to what? The tree of life, and we may enter through the gates into the city. And so it is a beautiful thing to see and to, to try to wrap our brain around that awaits for us at the end. And to show the perfectness of it, look at what it is separated from. He talks about the sorcerers, the dogs, sexually immoral, and murderers, idolaters, whoever loves and practices a lie. They're not going to be in this city. They're not going to be there. We are going to be there. Um, and although he says outside the walls, um, it's not where you can walk over and, and look over in an imminent danger. They are no danger. They, there's, they are not there with us in that city. 
All right, any um, other thoughts or comments on this? All right, let's turn real quick now then to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> and let's um, go to verse 50. Let's see. It's going to be a long way to scroll. Let me retype that. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and read the first. Uh, we'll break this one up. We're going to read verses 50 through the end of the chapter here. And Dell, if you would, begin there in verse 50, and let's read down through verse 53, please. Did you say me? Dell, yep. Read 50 of where? Uh, through 53, please. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you, a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be, cha all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of, twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and they will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Okay, and I'll finish it up. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The reason for our faithfulness is quite simply stated here. Because of our faithfulness unto God, the statement has come to pass that says death is swallowed up in victory. You know, we think about um, in our Wednesday night class when we studied through um, this particular statement there, death for most people is a fearful thing and really the end of all things. I mean, people may think about an afterlife and some may believe in some type of afterlife, but unless you have faith in God, death is a certain end with a huge question mark. And our faith fills in that question mark so much so that the death that we die on this earth is swallowed up, if you would, in victory that we have in Christ. Um, and so he says there, in quoting from Psalms, I believe it is, I need to go back and check, oh death, where is your sting? There's the question. Oh Hades, where is your victory? Well, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but the victory comes through whom? Our Lord Jesus Christ, that's right. All right, any thoughts or comments? Like I said, this lesson is a little bit shorter than some of the other ones. Not, not by much, just a little bit. And so all of the second page is kind of dedicated to, if you want to work it later, just what else can we do to be faithful to the end? You know, a lot of these things, like I said at the beginning, were more what might be viewed as generalized statements or principles. That probably would be a better way of looking at it. But we could talk about strengthening our faith by studying every day, um, reassuring ourselves by praying to God every day, um, assembling with the saints, um, all the way to learning from our lessons. I mean, if an individual gives in to sin, one of the best things that you can, the, one of the best things come from m mistakes is learning from those mistakes. Um, it's kind of like teaching a young person to drive. Um, sometimes you just got to let them mess up because then they learn from that mistake. And you're hoping it's not an expensive mistake, though. Um, because, you know, you, you can tell them all day long, don't, don't, don't. But then when they finally do it and they realize they shouldn't have, then it kind of embeds a little bit stronger, or should, hopefully, in the brain. And so there are a lot of things we can talk about here. Um, any, any, though, any further thoughts or comments on today's study? <coughs> Like I said, I'm not certain. I've got to, um, I had intended over the Christmas break to look ahead, but we've got a couple of studies um, upcoming. We've got the, the year-long study that we're going to be looking at one lesson a month that we've got to continue laying some groundwork for and some foundations for that. So I'll be working on that in the next couple of weeks. Um, and uh, just some other things we're working on. So I may see if we can generate a couple of more uh, blessed are lessons and um, if y'all would like a full copy of this I've been you know, handing them out you know, piecemeal each week as we've gone along I can actually uh, bind a couple of complete 
studies of that if you would find it helpful. Um, any, any suggestions or anything else maybe that y'all would like to look at as we continue this class through the end of March, maybe 1st of April? Now don't suggest Ezekiel because we don't have enough time for that. <laughs> maybe a future study. Okay. We could look at something. Uh, this was the positive blessed ours. We could look at something negative for those that that aren't blessed for doing other things and compare compare the, the contrast. Just study the contrast of this. Yeah, we're supposed to be positive people, not negative. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, that is an interesting, uh, interesting thought because uh, when children of Israel were led out of Egypt, they, there were two mountains, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. One was considered the Mount of Blessing, one was considered the Mount of Cursing. And when you look at Deuteronomy, there are blessings and cursings, and it's very simple. Blessed are you uh, if you do A, B, C, and D, but if not, here's the cursings, and it's all about how God would punish them. And the mountains were kind of used as proclamation of the blessings or cursings, depending on the situation. And so there is kind of a, a, a similar type statement here. We've looked at blessed are if we do this, this, and this, and that. But then you're, you're talking about a series of lessons where you look at cursed are, if we're to follow in kind of the vein, and there's you credence can, for that. You can bring out these scriptures, the blessed are scriptures, and then find the scripture that uh, is exactly opposite of that. Some scriptures pertaining to what happens if you don't do that. Let me mull that over. I like that idea. That's, that's definitely workable. Yes, Pat? Have we ever studied Joshua? The book of Joshua? That Old New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't remember. No, not in, not in this class. It reveals a lot about Jehovah that is yeah. good to know. And it, and it just come out of the wilderness and it's the beginning live. Yeah. And, and I just, I've been reading it. Well, I've read it before, before, but I never remember anything. <laughs> um, well, we, when we started this class, going back when we first moved here, we were looking at, that we studied the Beatitudes, um, working through Paul Arnhart's book on the Beatitudes. But then from there, I think, I thought there was one intermediate study, and I don't remember, but what long after that went in Daniel, and in Daniel we, we studied um, uh, Haggai and Zechariah as the two you know, prophets around the time, and then we went through um, Ezra and Nehemiah, and then spent, what, two years in Revelation. That's why we wanted a simpler study. <laughs> so, um, so let, me, let me think about that, Pat. That would actually, I think a book study may be good to start in the fall of 2016 where we could potentially take the whole year. And we've had a year off from book study, so that might be where we will have had a year off from that. So it may be something to think about. Yeah. But Dan, I'm going to work on that idea. I think that may be something very good. Anaps that are? Yeah, Anaps. <laughs> Cursed is easier to say. Okay. All right, any other thoughts or comments? I appreciate everyone coming out. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. And, and uh, Gene, would you mind directing our minds to that prayer? Our gracious Lord, we're grateful to Thee for all the blessings we have from Thee in this life. The ability we have to study Thy Word, to be strengthened by it, to be encouraged by our association with other Christians, to be strengthened in our lives, that we might reflect Thy Word in all that we do. And through us, the light of the truth is signed to the dark, a very, very dark world. Pray, Father, that you be with us as we leave here this morning. Bless us in our lives and our lives be faithful to thee. We pray through Christ, our Son, and our Savior. Amen. Amen.